Hello. I'm here in this beautiful University of New Mexico campus near fountains and beautiful trees and beautiful plants. This used to be home for me. I taught here many, many years. I have, and I was a student here, so I have wonderful memories of this campus. This, people in this campus have been very good to me, have been very helpful in my career. And today, um, we're sort of catching up with a lot of taping that's going on in my life. You understand I'm getting very old. I'm 88 years old, so people are trying to capture my life on tape. So what we're going to try to do today is let you know how this is going to work. They have many tapes all over campus and places where I've talked to groups, and I'm going to be jumping in and out of those tapes every once in a while. I'll I'll cut into tape and say, this is where we were, this is what we were doing. Whatever comes up that's natural so that you can see all these wonderful tapes that these people have made for me over the years. So I'm hoping you enjoy it. I, I'm just thrilled to death that this is being made for me. Thank you so much. Qué lindo nombre, señores, el de esta Honduras sin igual. Ella es mi patria querida y también fue de morazán. Tiene su virgen morena, la cual... Okay, well, without further ado, now it's time to introduce our guest speaker. And being the person that she is, she, we asked her for a bio and she furnished a very short one. She has had an extensive career, as we all know, and she's done so many wonderful things. But we're going to touch only on the highlights of her career right now. Ambassador Jaramillo was born and raised in what she calls the real Las Vegas. Las Vegas, Nuevo Mexico. She is a daughter, a mother, wife, and scholar. Some of her many accomplishments include Associate Dean at the University of New Mexico, Vice Chair of the Board of Regents at New Mexico Highlands University, Advocate and Developer of the First Laws on Bilingual Education in New Mexico, United States Ambassador to Honduras, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Latin America under the Carter Administration, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Latin America during the Clinton Administration. In spite of all these amazing accomplishments, Lucy, Marie Lucy is extremely humble. As we say in New Mexico, es muy buena gente. She has a very clever sense of humor, and she is just plain fun to be around. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. and Ambassador Maria Lucy Caramillo. guys, you're going to make me cry. All of you should know I have a tearing problem. <laughs> Thank you, Madam President. You know, she's a pretty special professional. She's so special, she took out a whole page of what I was going to say. <laughs> anyway, I'm as pleased as sponge that so many of my friends have come here today. I have done absolutely no public speaking in years, so I'm really rusty, so you just have to put up with me. We are in this together, let's see what happens, okay? <laughs> Before I start on my prepared remarks, I must, I want to tell you that the membership of the council thinks that I am their stand-up comedian. <laughs> I can get really silly and we all have lots of fun. But today I plan to be a little more serious and senior-like. 
I am 88, you know. I hope I can pull it off. My remarks are about 20 minutes long, like a mini lecture. It doesn't go from when the bell rings to when the bell ends. It's going to be about 20 minutes. And if, if I don't ad lib too much. <laughs> then you get to ask questions about the nitty gritty of being an ambassador, what you'd really like to know. And that way it breaks it into two parts so we don't all get tired. And, I, and what I like about the questions, I get to make up the answers as I go along. <laughs> okay, thank you for coming to hear me review a part of my life that was very rewarding, sometimes quite serious, and oftentimes lots of fun. My hosts have asked I include some highlights while serving as ambassador, and also what I have learned along the way. It is very difficult for me to talk about myself. As many of you know, I shy away from it. But I decided this time I was really going to try and share what friends say made me successful. But before going any further, I want to apologize for my squeaky old voice. Even though I have a solid reputation of being an habladora. Que habla hasta por los codos. And you should know I'm stone deaf. I promise you will be witness to that affliction before this is over. Bueno, my friends, let's start. 39 years ago, some of you weren't born then, I was a University of New Mexico full professor. That does not mean full of myself. It, <laughs> it means I had met all the requirements and my colleagues liked me. So that's why I was a full professor. I had a PhD. I was fully bilingual and multicultural, having worked and traveled extensively throughout Latin America for many, many, many years. I was heavily involved in the civil rights movement as well as in cultural awareness and spoke across the entire United States to diverse audiences on these issues. My work had been to spread the word about high quality education in an effort to help eliminate poverty and discrimination. I deeply cared about the poor and justice to all. In the spring semester of 1977, woo, that's long ago, <laughs> I was busily preparing for my next class in my tiny cramped campus office when the phone rang. When I picked up the phone, the caller identified himself as Deputy Secretary of State. Yeah, sure. Mr. Warren Christopher, some of you recall, brilliant lawyer, and he was calling on behalf of President Carter. Yeah, sure, <laughs> I said to myself. Mr. Christopher said Mr. President Carter wanted me to be his ambassador to Honduras. I didn't even know what an ambassador did. The president was looking for someone to match his unfolding agenda for expanding democracy internationally and promoting human rights across the world. Remember those words, human rights. Apparently, my credentials matched the president's aspirations and wanted to know if I would accept his invitation. OK, here we go. Because it was near April Fool's Day, <laughs> I was sure it was one of my students playing a trick on me. That's the way I got along with my students. Mr. Christopher told me to tell no one except my husband and my doctor about the offer. He said I had until the following Monday to respond. That gave me about four days. When he added that I was to call, collect, and he gave me a DC number, I knew the call was for real. Those weren't my students. 
Following the call, the CIA contacted many people who knew me. I had to pretend I did not know what it was all about. I couldn't say anything. My mentor and father figure, Dr. Frank Angel, some of you remember him, called me one day and said, Mijita, I told you over and over not to call yourself a Chicana. <laughs> Now the CIA is investigating. <laughs> you might be in a lot of trouble. I just got a call and I did all I could to help you. But be careful, Mihita. How it hurt, I could not tell him the truth. Eventually, the Senate confirmed me and I became a full-fledged ambassador. Most of my friends thought I was going to British Honduras. Only my 96, 96 year old Nanita got it right. She said, 96, long ago when I was in second grade, we learned that Honduras was below Mexico and near Guatemala. Bingo, she was on target. So after a few days of celebration with family and friends and lots of packing, off we went to Honduras. <coughs> when we arrived, I was quickly whisked off to address the country via TV in my first public remarks in Honduras. I trembled right through it all, but everyone was awed by my flawless Spanish my northern New Mexican Spanish <laughs> and Mexican Spanish that I had been told all my life was not good, quite good enough because it was not Castilian. Anyway, at that moment on TV, with that Spanish, I made friends at all levels of society in one, one bang. There was no time to be scared the official work started immediately for this New Mexican woman. Courtesy calls to all the ministers, attendance at dozens of receptions, meeting the large embassy staff and their families, discovering the most important issues that needed immediate work, and responding to the constant flow of memoranda from the State Department. My days quickly became 16-hour days of work, and for three years, my workload never slowed down. And I was like a Mexican Ginger Rogers. I did it all in high heels. <laughs> the department assigned me some very serious goals. Some were just routine ones like make sure that American businessmen meet the right people. Businessmen, there were no women around at that time. And ensure that Honduras voted with, uh, with us on international affairs, and so on. Those were easy. I just had to keep on my toes. No big deal. Hello, here I am back again. I love to interrupt myself. You know, I just wanted to just repeat something that I had said before, so I'm going to go ahead and read for you. I just want to reinforce how very serious the two major goals I took to heart were. One of them was to continue to help settle the border dispute between Honduras and El Salvador. That conflict was called the football war, some of you may remember. It has gone on for many, many years. We'd see it on TV often. I used every tactic in my civilian arsenal that I could think of to help create movement toward a resolution. I worked on this until the very end of my three-year tenure. Upon returning to the United States and while working in DC in the State Department, the two countries signed a peace treaty to much fanfare. President Carter asked I represent him at the signing ceremony 
because of my team's contribution to the peaceful resolution. I was so honored. The second very important goal was to help Hondurans continue their discussions about returning to a democratic form of government. The country had been a military dictatorship for many, many years. This major goal became my reason for living during the entire three years that I was there. I will now share some of the things I was engaged in to help the momentum in this field. Every time I met with anyone in the military from the president on down, I would bring up the idea that Honduras was a country that had an opportunity to become a democracy, like so many other countries were doing at the time. And I would add reasons and strategies that could be used to achieve such dreams. I was making it all up, Miss Hijos. <laughs> I knew little about how strong the entrenchment of the military at all levels of the government were. But I did not know, but I did know that these soldiers loved their country. So I worked to see if I could plant seeds to help them with their own thinking about needed changes. Well, after about two years that I had been in Honduras, working my heart out on this one goal, the military did return to the barracks. You You have no idea how pleased I was. <clears throat> my work, along with the work of many Hondurans, had paid off even though my work had to remain in the shadows and only a handful of Americans knew what I had done. I had to act surprised with the decision and the huge movement that started to unfold. Think of all they had to do. They had to update a constitution write up procedures for elections, reinstate and develop political parties, and on and on and on. But people stood up and volunteered all over the country to work, get the work done. And it was accomplished in a timely fashion, although not completely finished before I left. Actual elections and installation of a civilian president and officials took place about a year after I left the country. I was invited by the newly elected Honduran government as a guest of honor at all the events. <clears throat> it was one of the greatest days I have lived, and I still could tell no one about my role in the entire process. Today, I can tell you because most of my secret memos are now declassified. <laughs> Those two goals were the biggies. They took most of my waking hours, but we also had time for lots of fun. I want to share a lighter moment. About three months after arriving on post, I was notified that a congressional delegation was coming and a senator would be staying at the embassy residence. I was scared silly because I was not familiar with the diplomatic pro protocol. I had been sent immediately to Honduras and had to skip, skip that orientation. I did not really know what was expected. So the first thing I did was call the resident staff together. I told them who was coming to visit and reminded them that we were in this together. <laughs> if it didn't work really well, maybe all of us would lose our jobs. When the senator arrived for lunch at the embassy residence, I greeted him and we went to be seated at a beautifully appointed table. The conversation was going well and the food was delicious, but one of the waiters kept coming to me and asked what I wanted. I would tell him, all is fine. But he came again and again and again. Finally, I leaned in close to the waiter and I asked him why he kept coming over and over 
and I told him all was well, he replied in a voice everybody could hear. Madam Ambassador, you're stepping on the bell and the bell tells me you need me. <laughs> I, I said, what bell? And I grabbed the beautifully pressed tablecloth, lifted it up and poked my head under the table. Very ambassadorial, I'm sure. I was to, about to ask where the bell was when I saw the small gleaming piece of highly polished metal embedded in the thick carpet, right where I was placing my foot. <laughs> of course, I roared with laughter, and I thanked Polo profusely for teaching me where the bell was. <laughs> oh well, so much for making an impression on our guest. We all, including him, shared a laugh but from then on, I kept my foot far away from that bell. <laughs> I learned so many important things in my classy job. I had so many other hilarious things happen to me. Even with all the hard work I had to engage in, I enjoyed tons of laughter just simply making fun of myself. I think these missteps could be called ambassadorial boo-boos. Is that not a great title for a book? <laughs> I now want to tell you about the friends I made for our country. This is so New Mexican. In my briefings, I learned I was to engage government officials and the business community, both Honduran and American. But something in my heart told me that was not enough. What about all the others? So I decided I was going to be the American ambassador to everyone I possibly could. Let me share some of the activities I engaged in. There were still parts of previous political parties that had been active before the military takeover. There were still politicians who wanted to return to power. I courted those people and talked with them about their aspirations. This became very helpful during the discussions of forming a new government. I made friends with all levels of the military, not just the ranking ones. The rich civilians were easy to meet because they had always been the friends of the embassy, so they became dear friends. But I courted the poor wherever I went. I also became friends with many of the church officials. I went to a different church in each Sunday, just to meet, more, to meet more people. I knew every church in that huge city, and I made many new friends and acquaintances. I took a road trip that took several days through mountainous territory, sometimes no roads, only ruts. An American ambassador had never been there before, and what is more, Many told us that they had never seen a military leader in the area either. All this adventure was to make friends for my country. I did not think I had been sent to stay in the beautiful residence or play golf with the rich. I was on a mission to get my country known, respected, and loved. My work was easy with Jimmy Carter as president. Another place I made a lot of friends was in the plantations and in the fields where I would stop the limo and get down to talk with the workers. I loved meeting with the laborers. Anyway, when I was saying my public goodbyes when I was about to leave, there was an outpouring of hundreds and hundreds of workers and other people. People came in cars, in trucks, in wagons, by horseback by buses, and even walking several miles. I recall the head labor person in the embassy saying to me, Madam Ambassador, I have been in the Foreign Service for almost 30 years, and I never recall a gathering like this for an amb American ambassador. You have won the hearts of these people. I need to tell you that particular gathering was not easy for me. A speaker after speaker got up to say nice things about me, 
my tearing started big time. <laughs> you know, I suffer from uncontrollable tearing, so if an emotion changes in me, woohoo, Yorona. <laughs> <laughs> By the time I got up to thank them, I know I was a sorry mess. Next, time, next day, the headlines in the newspapers all over the country read, the ambassador cried for us, and we on Durance cried for her. <laughs> that, that day, I had made friends for our country, and these included <clears throat> the masses of poor people. I had met my personal goal. As I already told you, I was always also asked to share my wisdom, Dios mio, <laughs> and qualities that helped me while I served as ambassador. Why do people give me such difficult tasks? Híjole! <laughs> what I would like to do is share some personal thoughts that might provide insight into some of my accomplishments during my really long and varied career. Let me begin with a story. I have always felt that one of my successes in being an ambassador was that I read everything, and I'm a speed reader to boot. I am sure the word got out in the embassy that this woman reads everything. I would respond by the next morning to all documents I also need only four hours sleep. Given me to the night before with good old school teacher circles and questions on the margin. <laughs> Could you elaborate a bit more here? To those guys that have never been asked to do anything like this. <laughs> I don't quite understand this. An embassy person told me that was one of the things that most impressed them. This one had, did not put her name to anything unless she read it closely. I have always said that having learned to read in the first grade helped me be an ambassador. <laughs> I also grew up in an environment <clears throat> that helped me to develop observational skills and sensitivity to the nuances of the people around me. As a child, I watched how a teacher behaved, and I watched how the kids she liked behaved, and then I acted like those kids. <laughs> and soon I was one of them, no more outsider. I don't know if it works in jobs too, but you ought to try it. I would listen not only to the words, but the actions and pauses that tell you so many things. In essence, I learned to adjust and swing, just like you change your gears. My gear shifting or ability to work with diverse audiences also grew with the education I picked up by acquiring degrees in both English and Spanish. I gained ways to communicate and work with others. I also minored in sociology and psychology to better understand individual behavior and the influence of society. What am I saying? Not majored. I studied lots of psychology and um, sociology and many other things. I didn't major in them. They say that education opens doors. Yes, but I also believe that we need to be open to changing and seek opportunities to try new things and not be afraid when opportunity comes knocking at our door. I have been terribly shy all my life. The person you see is the one I created to get up in front of audiences. <laughs> But, the, but you have to stay open to change and opportunity. And of course, to earn a pretty good living. <laughs> and before I forget, if you haven't noticed, I ha also have a little angel that sits on my shoulder. And she tells me which way to go, where to stop, where not to go in. 
As some of you know, I have always had very high expectations of myself, and I'm so persistent in what I want to achieve. Once I say I'm going to do this, I'll be dead, and, but I'm going to get trying. My parents thought if we got an education, we would get out of poverty. My father, a f who had a fourth grade education in Mexico, provided the example of always reading and studying and learning more. And my mother, who had a seventh grade education here, provided the environment for us to study. We came home to study, 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 and do our homework. As a result, my siblings and I became excellent students. Anyway, these values followed me all my life. I wanted every child that came out of my room to speak English well, to read, to be happy and well-adjusted. In every job, I have taken the attitude of, I don't know hardly anything about it, but I'm going to do my very best. I have shared a little of my background and successes. I also believe that my work and upbringing helped me to develop a strong, strong sense of empathy. My positive feelings, thoughts, and attitudes towards others motivated me to pursue work in human rights and democratic freedom. This translated into many interesting events in my life and it made me a team player. I would learn people's names. Oh, how it hurts that now I'm forgetting names. I would learn all about their troubles and their problems. And I would learn what made them happy and what their pleasures were. I try to personalize everything, and I still do. Personalize everything. I don't care how smart we might be, it is crucial to respect everyone, young and old. Another motto I have is, be kind to all. And I know you all possess the same motto. Just look at how kind you've been to me while listening to my squeaky voice for 20 minutes. <laughs> Thank you for being such a kind audience. I love you mucho, los quiero mucho. Thank you. Up, James. Thank you. Thank you so much. If I don't know the answer, I'll make it up for you. First question. Describe the residence you lived in while in Honduras. I got to get it. I told you. Can't hear. Oh, okay. Um, they want me to describe the residence. It was a huge, huge mansion on top of a hill, a winding hill, and, and then you went down a long uh, driveway with orchids everywhere and bougainvillea and it's just a tropical paradise. And you got into the house, and the house was made of beautiful greenish and rose uh, stone and it had never been painted it had the greenish and the rose uh, tinge to the whole thing and it was a big um, two floors as you got in and that was the like the public space with huge living rooms with huge dining rooms um, in the bottom there was a big room with a pool table and chairs and, and there was a winding staircase uh, with a thick red carpet. I mean it was, you see Jose, I had never seen anything like that before. And then the wing, uh, the private wing, uh, another beautiful dining room, the story I told you was in that private dining room and a huge kitchen. Um, uh, lots of, uh, of bedrooms across the hall and bathrooms. And the ambassadors 
uh, bedroom was downstairs and you looked out in this tropical garden that wouldn't quit. It was just beautiful. There were 16 gardeners and 11 staff inside the house. Imagine me, I had always, you know, the way I made money to go to school was clean people's houses and now there's staff there. So they were very surprised that I could, could do everything for myself. <laughs> Thank you. Next question. What was the communication system between the embassy and the U.S. State Department? This was all before email, right? Right. Yeah, remember I told you 39 years ago. Um, they sent something like telegrams. We called it traffic. And the telegrams would come into a certain place in the residence, in the embassy. And then those were brought by secretaries, given to whoever needed them. And they were brought to me. And then we would, we had secretaries everywhere, uh, no, no computers. Uh, we would dictate our answers and the secretaries would write them up and send them back. And there were hundreds that came during the day because it covered all the fields, like the businesses that people are interested in, um, trouble with somebody not getting a visa, that was the biggest concern that, we, that I had that caused me problems, that everybody wanted a visa. And, they were very tight with them, so that was something. But that's the kind of information that went back and forth. You can imagine how slow that was compared to today, where everything moves so fast. I don't know if I could be an ambassador today and keep up with my email. I can't keep up with my email at home. <laughs> Describe a typical day as ambassador to Honduras. A typical day, OK. I already told you that I only sleep, need to sleep four or five hours, so I have a lot of time. And I would get up at, say, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. Uh, maybe I would walk a little bit in the gardens, uh, get ready, um, have some breakfast, and this just, it wiped the people in the embassy out. <laughs> if I didn't have a noon appointment, I would pack my lunch. And here's the American ambassador with all these guards and security guys and chauffeurs and the limousine and all the things. And there I am with my little bag. <laughs> and I would uh, get, most people would get to the office at 8. It would be from 8 to 5. Well, I'd get there about 7 or 7.15. I always start working. So pretty soon, people started coming in earlier and earlier. <laughs> pretty soon, we're all there at 7. <laughs> Never a word was said. And then I had meetings, back-to-back -back meetings all the time, sometimes with Americans, sometimes with Hondurans, sometimes with staff, people writing uh, uh, proposals. And I, you know, we'd discuss the proposals. I started every day with a country team meeting. All 15 country directors would come in and we'd start in with a meeting, talk about uh, what we were going to do that day, what had gone wrong yesterday, what we could do to help each other. And that started the day. Went through meeting after meeting after meeting. Sometimes at noon I went to a fancy lunch, came back, did not take a, a siesta, did not go play golf, just keep working, working, working until about five, and then I would go home, shower, put on new clothes, uh, a long dress, and a corsage maybe, and another pair of high heels, ya quite voy. So then that was receptions all over the place, you know, beautiful parties, dancing parties, costume parties, all kinds of parties. It was a wonderful time in the evening. That's where the ambassadors do their work. That's where you find out what people are thinking. That's when you drop the hints of what's going on. If there was, then some of those nights we're having parties at the American residence. So that night I don't have to go out. 
where we meet people here. And the only way you can spend American money on these get-togethers is if you have uh, foreigners in your party. So we would have these parties for uh, Hondurans, and that way a few Americans could go to. As you know, I went as a university professor with very low salary, and all I got as, a, as an ambassador was 10% more than I had been earning here. So I had to dig into my own pocket to have a lot of these uh, parties. That's why only rich people go, but I got to go. <laughs> Would you be so kind as to share your thoughts and experience of what in your opinion, is needed in our community to increase leadership and education level, especially among our Hispanic girls? That's a tough one. I think I shared a little bit of what was happening in my home. If we could just share that with people in their homes so that by the time kids come to school, they have a wonderful a way of looking at this is school where I'm at and I'm going to learn everything. I think a lot of stuff to do with parents and in the homes, uh, that that would get us up a little bit. And then in the schools, I wish that there wasn't so much meddling in our schools. I wish they'd let <laughs> teachers teach. That's, I, I remember the last the last class that I did for the university, that I was all gun ho about uh, things that teachers could do to excite the kids and all these things. And I remember that one of the students said, oh boy, thank you. One of the students said, Dr. Jaramillo, that doesn't work because we have to follow the plans that they've given us for the day and we don't make exceptions for individuals. We don't do these things that you're talking about. That was the last class I taught. No puedo. <laughs> Have you been back to Honduras? And tell us about the last time you went back there. OK. Um, I've been back to Honduras probably about four times. Three times I went because they had had a hurricane. And I would go and see the damage for myself, uh, take pictures, and come back and try to write, raise funds in the United States. And I did that several times. And then I went a couple of times with friends just, just to visit Honduras. And you know what? I'm going to confess, I had forgotten about the change of weather, and I took the wrong kind of clothes. <laughs> You know, it's just the opposite of over here, and I was freezing because it's when the cold winds come in, which is a very short period of time, but that's what I did. <laughs> Where can we get your book? Where can you get my book? It's called Madam Ambassador, The Shoemaker's Daughter. I think they sell it in the store here. I'm not sure. You can get it on Amazon. Amazon, you can ask for second-hand copies and they don't cost so much. A lot of my friends have gotten those. So they are available in all the bookstores. Sometimes you have to order them. It has done extremely well to be uh, such an old book. It's 10 years old. <laughs> Did your husband accompany you as ambassador, and what was his role? OK. I was accompanied by the husband I had then. And his role was that he couldn't earn any money because I was the boss of all the Americans in Honduras. So what he did was he went with Peace Corps and went out with all the excursions in Peace Corps and did things like this. Marie Lucy, this is related to Peace Corps. Tell us about your experience with oh. the Peace Corps. Now that's a real question. I could talk about it for two hours. I think the Peace Corps are the best ambassadors the United States has. <laughs> She's a former member. <laughs> She's a former Peace Corps uh, member. Uh, they were in the roughest places, living under horrible conditions. 
you have no idea what those people uh, lived by. Yet they had this passion that they were going to help the poorest of the poor. And so they worked in all departments, in all levels, in far out places that they'd come into town only once in a while. They did fabulous work, fabulous work. I, I'm just so proud of Peace Corps. And I want to tell you that one personal thing that I did for them, you know, I lived in this mansion with this huge Olympic swimming pool and the bath houses, and you can just imagine what it was like. And I opened my house for any Peace Corps person that came into the city or the ones that lived already in the city to use the swimming pool. Well, it was unheard of. You don't do these things, you know. And here comes our Peace Corps people who had been out in the boonies for three months. And then some of them started to bring their laundry. <laughs> <laughs> and they would do their laundry because you know, we had machines there, so they would do their laundry. We didn't have dryers, and before you know it, the staff started complaining. They were hanging all their things on the bushes. <laughs> and I loved it. I said, more power to you. And I don't care who gets mad, they're going to continue doing this. And they were kind of shocked. You know. And then the other thing I did for them was at every party that I had in the residence, two or three slots were left for any Peace Corps people that would be in town. And so we always had two or three people, Peace Corps people at our parties. I love them. <laughs> if I may add to that, I uh, joined Peace Corps in 1989, went to Honduras, and of course, my Lucy was already gone, but her name was very much alive and um, I do recall stories about Peace Corps volunteers that um, were already there when I arrived, and they talked about the swimming pool being opened by Ambassador Jaramillo. <laughs> and, and everybody in that Peace Corps office, the ones that had the privilege of having been to the swimming pool and to the embassy, they just adored her. The rest <laughs> of us, we just salivated. <laughs> But I will have to add that um, from Tegucigalpa to Olancho to San Pedro Sula to Siguatipeque, her name was known by everyone. And I will have to say that I will go to my grave thinking, <laughs> believing, believing that she may have even saved my life at one time. That's, that's as Thank far you. as I'll go. Thank you. Marie Lucy, when a movie is made, and this is when, when a movie is made of your life, which actress would you like to portray you? <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't think a movie's going to be made. <laughs> um, what beautiful woman would I want to? <laughs> Benji Zamora. Oh, yay, yay. <laughs> oh, that's great. Okay. Okay. Do you have children? What do they do? If too personal, do not answer. Okay, my children. Okay, I have a son named Rasu Libarri who lives in Taos. He's retired. He has a beautiful new home that's like a cocoon. This year they didn't spend one penny in electricity or gas. Not one penny. And it's a community of 31 homes and it's just a great place. And he has a wife named Kristen that I adore. And my only granddaughter belongs to them, and I've got a brag. She, she has a BA from Harvard, an MA from Oxford, and a PhD from Stanford. <laughs> and 
She just got her first job and she's going to work at UC Irvine and she's in the planning, sociology, engineering, something else department. <laughs> and so I know she's going to do very well as she's my only granddaughter. And then I have a daughter that has two sons. She worked for 13 years as a teacher at Valley High School. She was the head of computer and math sciences. Uh, then one summer she came to work at uh, Sandia and they asked her to stay. I remember she came to me and she said, Mom, you're going to be so disappointed. I think I'm going to leave school unless you're going to get upset about it. <laughs> said, no, Mijita, if everybody would give at least 10 years of their professional lives when they're young to schools, our schools would be much better. So she went to Sandia and she stayed there and she retired this year. And she has the two sons that are not gifted like the girl, but are normal. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have another son who works at Los Alamos and he's the liaison with the state legislature. Um, he dated a wonderful woman with a little girl for 17 years and I want you to know that February 29th they got married. <laughs> he says they chose February 29th. He chose it because he only has to give her a present every four years. <laughs> I got a crazy family. <laughs> What are the funniest things that happened to you while in Honduras? Oh my God. <laughs> How much time do we have? <laughs> Usually I know that somebody will ask a question like that. I'm just going to go in my list and see which ones you want. <laughs> I have this list. I have told one story that everybody just loves. In fact, right now in this audience, two people have asked me, would you tell that story? <laughs> One of them was very honest. She said, that's the only thing I remember from a previous speech you gave. <laughs> anyway, I want to tell you, you know that dining room that I told you about the story where I was stepping on the bell? Well, in that, oh, excuse me, in that beautiful, uh, in that beautiful uh, dining room, I had some more visitors and I had to, this were really special visitors and I had told them all the staff we had to be on our toes you know please polish all the silver the platters please make sure that all the doilies are starched heavily you know the bit you know so so they had done all of that and so we're back in that dining room just having a fabulous fabulous um, I think that one was a dinner. And anyway, those of you that are very observant have seen that I have a Kleenex in my hand and that air constantly, constantly. So I'm at this fabulous dinner and I don't have my Kleenex. Oh my God, what do I do? I needed Kleenex so badly. I, I'm just dying if I don't get a Kleenex. Thought that, I had told them to start the, <laughs> the tablecloth and the napkin, so that wasn't going to work. I had a slim skirt on. I used to be able to wear slim skirts, and the, you know there was no way I could pull that one up. What was I going to do? So I was just about ready to get up, and that I didn't want to because I was reading Emily Post and. The hostess never gets up from her seat unless it's on fire. And so I didn't know what I was going to do. So finally, I thought, I'll call Polo. So Polo comes in. There he is. Oh, I can just see him with, uh, dressed with his napkin here and Madame Ambassador. I said, whispered to him, Please bring me a couple of squares of toilet tissue. <laughs> I didn't ask for Kleenex because I didn't know if there was Kleenex 
right near, near there, and I knew they could go get me two squares of toilet. So, si sí, senora, si sí, senora, si sí, senora. And he left, and there I am. Oh my God. My separated septum is really doing its thing. I didn't know what to do. Finally, after what I thought was a lifetime, the door opened and in walked my polo. Like this. <laughs> a highly polished tray. <laughs> an Im a beautifully ironed doily and a roll of toilet tissue. <laughs> That's the one you're going to remember. <laughs> I'll tell you another one. We have time for a couple more. Um, the first State Department dinner that I went to, I had been going through my briefings, uh, going through my briefings and Thank you. Going to the briefings and, oh, I loved to go to the places where they had all this documentation so I could read about Honduras. I, I just loved every minute of that. It, I was a student and I loved that. So my first sit-down banquet at the State Department, hundreds of people, just beautiful setting. And the Minister of Foreign Relations had come from Honduras, and I was seated at a beautiful table. And they had asked me if I had the proper attire, uh, you know, these kinds of things that you look different, and so they ask you questions. And so we're sitting there, and I'm enjoying it because we're talking in Spanish to the minister, and I'm, and we had this. Beautiful, beautiful banquet. Course after course after course after course. And then I thought we were ready for dessert. And in walked our waiter with a salad. And he put the salad in front of everybody and I went to pieces. I already told you how I feel about people, my empathy. <gasps> he had made a mistake. He brought the salad at the end instead of at the beginning. <laughs> I just about was dying in looking at that waiter, and I think, I bet you they're going to fire him tonight. I, you know. And then I looked, everybody had their salad at the end. It wasn't just my waiter, everybody was eating their salad. I've learned not to ask questions, you know, all over. I used to ask everything, well, why, why are they doing this? I waited, well, I found out in the State Department they serve a la French and the salad is after you finish eating. They didn't tell me that in New Mexico. <laughs> uh, one more, and then I gotta quit. I could go on all night. When I was in Honduras, quote, I was the most important person. And so nobody could sit to my right, okay? Nobody could sit to my right. I was the most important person there. When I walked in a room, everybody stood up. When I sat at a, at a meal, nobody could pick up their fork until I picked up mine. I mean, it was too much for this New Mexican woman who's been trying all their life to bring up some people to be like all the rest of the people. And there I was stuck with this. Well, this particular evening, I had been there a long time. I knew all these things already. And I was the first one served, the first one to go through the buffet line, came with my tray or my dish, and I sat down. And when I'd sit down, the next person, the next person, they'd all rush to sit with me. This time they kept going by with their dishes and sit someplace else. And I thought, wait a minute, what's going on? I showered, <laughs> I used scope, you know? What's happening? And I just couldn't get over it. I knew there was something very wrong. And so pretty soon here comes my deputy. And he leaned over and he whis whispered, you're in the seated at the wrong side of the sofa, Madam Ambassador. So I thought, now what do I do? So I got up 
with my food and pretended I was looking at this painting. <laughs> and I'm, I can still see the darn painting, you know? I studied it and then I walked over a little bit and looked around, splunked over there. Everybody rushed to sit with me. <laughs> see, protocol. Protocol is, you know, I didn't know a thing about it around here, you know, whatever chair you get, you sit, right? <laughs> and so I learned a little bit about it, but I didn't learn all the intricacies because they needed a, they were desperate for an ambassador to go, so they skipped that part, so I kind of made it up as I went along. <laughs> and with Emily Post reading every night, I learned a little bit. But I already knew all that, and it just slipped that I sat on the wrong side of the sofa. <laughs> well, thank you, Marie Lucy, for this wonderful, wonderful lecture and your insights. Thank you and for the audience. Thank, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Please, please don't. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Dormite, niñito, que tengo que hacer Lavar tus pañales, sentarme a coser Dormite, niñito, cabeza de ayote Si no te dormir, te come el coyote La Virgen lavaba, San José tendía El niño lloraba del frío que hacía arru arru ru arru arru ru arru arru ru arru ru 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 señora santana de que yo Manzanita de oro, aparece luego para que el niñito deje de llorar. Venite a mi casa, allí tengo dos, una para el niño.